Hello there. Kreuzo is Landav. Welcome to Landav for the European Heritage Day's Open Doors. I'm Jeff Barton Greenwood. I'm chairman of the Landav Society, on behalf of which I'd like to tell you something of the story of Landav, this 2,000-year-old special place. If you find a Tudor map, of Britain, you will see Landaff with an E on the end, clearly marked, but its history goes back much further to when the Romans found the lowest point where the legions could ford the waters of the River Taff to gain the rich agricultural lands of the Vale of Glamorgan. Evidence exists that they set up a small community on the spring line below this escarpment on which we stand. In the Dark Ages, the Welsh saints, Tylo, Dyfrig and Idogwi, followed their example, choosing Llandaff as their holy place on the Taff, where their church was built below the surrounding hills to be safe from the view of the marauding Vikings sailing up the Severn estuary. We're at St Tylo's well and I'm going to read to you the inscription. Below is reputedly the site of St. Tylo's well. St. Tylo was consecrated as the second bishop of Landaf in the 6th century and was one of the three Celtic saints in whose honour the cathedral church here at Landaf was dedicated. When the Normans invaded in the 11th century, they consecrated the first Landaf cathedral and also built this fortified bishop's palace as a convenient base from which to dominate the Welsh hinterland. Archbishop Baldwin was brought to Llandaff from Canterbury by the noted Welsh traveller and scribe Geraldus Cambrensis to preach the Third Crusade on these very steps of the preaching cross, duly recruiting many to serve in the Holy Land. And here we are at the preaching cross where Archbishop Baldwin preached the Third Crusade. It is believed that the palace was sacked by Owen Glyndwr's army in the 13th century, causing the ruin to fall into disuse, with the bishop moving to Mathry Palace near Chepstow. But the substantial ruins remain. For many centuries, Llandaff was the principal market town on the eastern edge of the Vale of Glamorgan, with weekly markets at which produce and stock were traded. It was an ecclesiastical city by virtue of its cathedral, coming to prominence in the English Civil War in 1646, when Cromwell's Roundheads billeted their horses in the cathedral nave before the Battle of St Fagans, at which the ever-rebellious Welsh forces were defeated. Indeed, my ancestor, Bartholomew, fought at this battle. With the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, coal from the valleys was brought down by cart, canal and later rail to Cardiff, which grew rapidly as a port. Welsh steam coal was in worldwide demand, opening up the oceans. So Ron the coal became Cardiff's gold, glow Ire, as we say, and as fortunes were made, Llandaff once more flourished in the Victorian era as the preferred place of residence for the well-to-do. Many of the fine houses were established and alongside these, housing for the supporting community of servants and artisans was provided. The cathedral was restored and embellished under the leading architect John Pritchard and notable at the forefront of society were the Matthews, the hereditary lords of Landaff, the insoles at Ely Court and the stock hills at Rookwood. The increasingly rowdy weekly fairs continued until suppressed as the new wave of evangelism and abstinence arrived in the time of Archdeacon Rice Buckley, whose statue dominates the green. He also led the way on the parish council with street lighting, proper sewers and mains water supplies. Howell's School for Girls and the Cathedral School offered fee-paying education and St Michael's Theological College provided training for the clergy. James Rice Buckley, Vicar of Llandaff, 1878 to 
1924. Archdeacon of Llandaff, 1913 to 1924. A man he was to all the country dear. With the centre of activity focused on Cardiff docks, it's not surprising that expat communities grew up and among incomers was Harold Dahl from Norway. He built a fine house at Fairwater Road and it was there in 1916 that his youngest son, Roald, was born. The boy went to Landoff Cathedral School and his school days in Landoff influenced him greatly. They were brought to life in his autobiography, Boy, in which he recounts the Great Mouse Plot centred around Mrs Pratchett's sweet shop in the High Street with its blue plaque. Roald Dahl went on to become known as the world's number one storyteller on the strength of children's books including Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda and uh, the Fantastic Mr Fox, plus of course the BFG. During the World Wars, Tlandaf provided a pleasant venue for the wounded, but this did not stop it being attacked by the Luftwaffe in January 1941, when three parachute mines floated out of the sky to land on the cathedral, St Michael's College and Prospect Drive. Fortunately, no one was killed, but the resulting explosions took the roof off the cathedral's nave, severely damaging St Michael's and several large houses. A tombstone was blown through the roof of the white house on the green, landing in the bath. The sublime war memorial on the green commemorates the fallen from the cathedral school and the community with its three bronze statues, the work of Sir William Goscombe John, and the cathedral was restored in the 1950s at a cost of £1.5 million. The magnificent Nicholson organ cost the same within the last 10 years. Well here we are at Land of War Memorial on the green and I'm going to read the inscription which says Land of remembers her own sons and those of the Cathedral School who gave their lives in the Great War and in the Second World War. Today the ancient city of Land of finds itself enveloped by Cardiff, the Welsh capital, into which it was absorbed in 1922. It nevertheless remains a distinctive place, being Cardiff's first conservation area and proud of its identity as a city within a city. Okay, the Land of Society has kept alive this spirit since 1977 when it was established as the Civic Society charged with the stimulation of public interest and pride, promotion of high standards of planning, architecture and design, promotion of environmental, economic and social sustainability, provision of public and community facilities and to secure the conservation of features of architectural, historical and public interest. With over 250 members, it is widely recognised as the lay voice of the community, working to build bridges with all. It normally holds monthly sessional meetings in the splendid new memorial hall just off the high street and presides over other events which include the midsummer strawberry tea party in the Bishop's Castle right here, which raises funds for the high street Christmas lighting, the annual outing to a national trust property, the annual dinner and the impressive open air service for Armistice Day which is increasingly well supported by all groups. If you'd like to join contact us at chairman at landofsociety.co.uk. Our website is www.landofcity.co.uk. If you have enjoyed this lockdown version of our Open Doors event why not visit Landeff with its vibrant shops, pubs and restaurants? Many are surprised and fascinated by its hidden attractions. <laughs>